Hi guys, it's Julie. Hey, thanks so much for letting me wait until Wednesday to do the video. I appreciate it. I was able to get back to the doctor on Monday and um, we're actually doing an MRI today. So I'll let you know how that goes. There's something going on with his shoulder, a ligament, a tendon, and you can imagine um, for a 16 year old boy, it's concerning and for a 16 year old boy who golfs, um, super concerning. So uh, we'll see what happens and, and I'll let you know. But anyway, I totally appreciate your grace on that and thank you so much for it. So, one week of Bible study down. You've read the first three chapters. You've got your questions. You've been answering your questions. Totally love the, the feedback and everything on the board. Um, I will not be responding to every single comment you make because obviously if I did that, our inboxes would just be flooded. But you guys have some really, really good insights. And I want to talk about just a couple of things that I've seen on the board and then um, share a little story with you and move on into to what you need to be doing this week other than just answering your questions. So, first of all, um, one of the questions that I posted that I, I really wanted you to focus on is, of course, um, what are some good things that can, can become idols? And you guys, really the gamut, um, obviously many of you, because we share this listed Stampin' Up. Stampin' Up is a great thing. It's given many of us an opportunity to provide for our families, to um, maybe strengthen us personally. I know for me, I've learned a lot of lessons about who I am as a direct result of Stampin' Up. Um, so some of us mentioned that. Others mentioned material possessions, appearance, what people think about us. Oh, that's a big one. That's a big one, especially for women, I think. Big, big one. Um, others mentioned family, um, um, you know, our kids. Others even mentioned, and I think this is a great one, um, you know, our, our, our work at church, the things that we try to do um, at places for God. And I want to park, park there for just a minute because I think it's very important to note, as we do this study, no other gods, as we do this study, um, we can become tempted, and, and I can see it a little bit, we can become tempted to let our desire to not have an idol become our idol. Does that make sense for you? We're going to work so hard to not have an idol that we can very easily take the next step into, you know what? I'm a good God girl. I don't have an idol. I don't have an idol. God is my idol. God is my idol. But not in the point that God is changing our lives, directing our lives, um, working in our lives so that others see Christ through us. But in such a way, it's like, would you look at me? Would you look at how good of a non-idol lover I am? Guys, that's kind of tricky when you, when you think about it, at least when I think about it as an English major. Um, you know, my mind tends to go all over the places. I, I just get all, all confused over the whole thing. But here's the thing of it that is important to note by identifying what those good things are that have become the idols in our life, we're going to start chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and seeing what can we do to get rid of those. How can that be gone? Now, here's the thing. It's not easy to say, okay, you know what? My business is my idol. My family is my idol. My appearance is my idol. What people think of me is my idol. My material possessions are my idol. So I'm just going to get rid of that. I want to think about it. What is an idol? We defined idol. We talked about idol as anything that takes the place of God in your life. So if you have elevated something to the point in your life that, that it is taking the place of God, in essence, that thing has become your God. Does that sound like an easy thing to get rid of? It doesn't to me. Maybe it will be to you, but it doesn't sound like it to me. So I want you to know, as we go through this, we're going to be working hard at figuring out how do we get rid of, of those idols. So that, that was one question we talked about. Um, we also did talk about an idol, and I just kind of alluded to that. You know, anything that takes the place of God, and we were all pretty clear on that. And I think um, many of us were kind of convicted about some things with that. So here's the question I have for you then, kind of piggybacking on what I just said. If we're going to get rid of an idol, we have to fill that spot up with something else. Because think about it, the reason something becomes an idol in the first place is because we have a hole within us that needs to be filled. We were made to worship something. We were made to worship God. But because we're not claiming that, we're filling that hole, that desire to worship something, whether it's ourself or something else, with something that is now becoming an idol. Does that make sense to you? So let's, let's follow this, this thought through. If we're going to get rid of an idol, there's a lot of hard work. And we're going to fill it up with something else. It makes sense that the thing we're going to fill it up with is something better than the idol that we've had. Now, it's very clear that the only thing that can fill us up, the only thing better, is God. So here's the thing. I'm wondering if the reason we're not filling our holes with God is because maybe we don't really trust that God can fill that hole. 
Is that a fair question? Maybe we don't really trust that he can fill it. Maybe in our deep down dark places that only we see at night, maybe we wonder, can God really do that? So the question I have is this, who is God? Well, the Bible tells us a lot of things about who is God. It starts off in Genesis saying who God is. God created the heavens and the earth. Um, God is our father God. The, the word is, is Abba, our daddy, you know, the guy that we can go to and cling to, the guy that loves us as a father would. God is the Jehovah God. God is the great I am. And that's the one that we can kind of focus on because you might have heard that said, God is the great I am. If you were to see it written, it would be a capital I and a capital A-M, I am. And, and what that really means is this, God is it. He is all. He is all over everything. He is all-knowing, all-encompassing, all-doing, omnipotent. Um, that means he knows everything and can be everywhere. And he loves us with a love that passes understanding. That's who God is. Now, if your understanding of who God is is not that, I can see why maybe it would be hard to believe that God could fill a hole that we're filling with other things. Because if you don't know that God is all of it, that God is I am, that God is Yahweh, which is the Hebrew word for God, which in fact is such a sacred word for God that the Hebrews wouldn't even say it. They wouldn't even write it down. It's spelled Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E and they would, would leave out the, the vowels in there. So it would be Y-H-W-H. -H. It would stand for Yahweh because they recognize that the power of who that is was too much for them to even say. God is the I am. God is the all. If you can get that clear, if I can get that clear, then surely, surely he is big enough to trust to fill my hole that getting rid of the idol will leave. That's an important thing, guys, because that is truly the only thing that can fill the hole. If you don't fill it with him, it will be filled with something else. It'll be filled with something else. You may um, break free of the chains of your business being your idol, but I can assure you, you'll fill it up with something else. And the only thing worth trusting to fill it up with, the only thing worth trusting is God. I want to give you an example of that. Um, in Luke, I'm going to pull my Bible over here real quick. In Luke chapter 5, and, and if you don't have your Bible, that certainly is not a big deal. You can, you can look it up later. But in Luke chapter 5, we have a situation where um, Jesus is starting his ministry and he is um, finding his first disciples. And this is an interaction that he has with Peter. Now, if you don't know much about Peter, I can tell you this. Peter is um, Peter's awesome. Peter is actually referred to later as the rock, the one on whom Christ is going to build his church. Peter as a person, from what we, we know and what we can understand, is um, is, is boisterous, is, is loyal to God. He's... Um, he, he's God's go-to guy. I mean, there were three disciples that were actually Jesus's um, inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And so Peter kind of gets a front row view to everything that's going on with Christ's ministry. But in Luke chapter five, listen as I start to read in verse one, it says, one day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them there and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now, something I want you to note here, Simon is Peter. Simon is the name that, that Peter had before Christ renamed him Peter, meaning rock, meaning the man I'm going to build my church on. Okay, that's another story for another day. But initially, he was known as Simon. One thing to note, there were two boats there. Jesus stepped into the one owned by Simon. He stepped into the one owned by Simon. Sometimes I think about that and I wonder why. Why would Jesus pick that boat to step into? Many, many answers. Some people might say, oh, it's just the one he stepped into. Um, I think he stepped into that boat because he knew, he knew that Simon Peter was going to have something to do for his kingdom. He knew what he had planned for him and he had to initiate a contact with him. I wonder if um, your being in this study is Jesus stepping into your boat? I wonder if this is Jesus stepping in saying, I know, I know what I have for you. What I have for you is better than what you have right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get in contact with you. I'm gonna step into your boat. I'm choosing your boat. Listen as we go on. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. 
Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. So think about this. Jesus gets in the boat. He's preaching. He's, he's pulled away from, this, from the, the shore because the crowds were large. He's chosen Simon's boat. Simon lets him in it. They go out. He preaches. And now Jesus says this, Simon, let's go out deeper. Let's go out farther. I want you to put down your nets and catch some fish. Now, in this case, he's talking about literal fish. He wants to show him what, what he can do. Um, certainly, though, there is a, a lot of symbolism there. But that, that being said, I want you to go catch some fish. Now, Peter responds. Simon resp responds and says, look, we worked hard all last night. We didn't catch anything. There's nothing there. Now, my dad is a fisherman. He does it for a hobby. And many of you may know fishermen. You may be a fisherman. I don't know. But um, you know, if you have gone out and you have fished and fished and fished and fished and fished and there is nothing there, then there's nothing there. The last thing you want to do is go back out and fish some more. But Jesus told Simon to do it. And Simon says, we, we did it. But you know what? If you say so, I'll go do it again. In verse 6, it continues and says, And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were sinking with fish and on the way to sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish he had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to him, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. I love that story. I love that story. Why do I tell you that story, though, in this Bible study about no other gods? Because we're talking about trust. We're talking about trusting in the one who, um, who knows you, who made you, who loves you. And when he gets in your boat and he says to you, let's do a thing, your answer of, I've tried that thing, it didn't work. Um, I don't want to do that thing. I know better about doing that thing. Let's not do that thing. When God gets in your boat and says, let's do a thing, girlfriend, do the thing. Do the thing. Because he has a plan for you. As he did with Peter, the nets filled overflowing with fish, they burst. Peter fell to his knees and said, you are it, God. You are it. You are it. And he left and followed Jesus. And we know lots and lots of stories to come about Peter. And if you don't know those stories, I'm gonna teach you some of them because they're really great. Guys, you can trust in who's gonna fill your hole when you let go of that idol. You can trust in the great I am. You can trust in God. You can trust in Yahweh. You can trust in Jehovah. You can trust in the character of the God that is in your boat and is loving you. I hope you have a great week. Um, I'll see you on video next week. I'll be praying for you, and, and let's just all pray for each other. Um, I love you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.